Welcome back everyone to Exploring Quantum Physics. I'm Charles Clark and today you're going to follow the bouncing ball. So just to remind you, uh, we're working with uh, special functions and today this part we're going to especially be uh, involved with the airy function. So I encourage you to uh, make this reference available to you. Though everything I'll show you is self-contained but this is a, a good source of uh, additional information. It's also appropriate for me to remind you of the short course, crash course on mathematics, uh, reference on the solution of Schrodinger equations, known Schrodinger equations, and uh, access to a numerical, uh, a simple numerical integrator that runs on a spreadsheet. In the previous part, we started out and we treated the first of these three simple one-dimensional examples, and we're now going to um, today uh, this part look at the linear potential. And I think I think actually we'll just we will have a very brief discussion about the quadratic potential at the end. I think the linear potential does sort of uh, is the best thing to focus on because it gives one a very good uh, framework for comprehensive understanding of the solution of the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. Now in the previous part we saw for this constant potential and we found that we could transform the Schrodinger e equation into a standard form. And the key point about that standard form, well there were two variants of it, difference in signs, uh, whether according to whether E was greater than or less than the constant V naught. Uh, but in both cases we had identified two solutions. Now, uh, I should have brought this point up in the in the previous part, but here's a really good tool for helping you to make decisions about choices of the alternative pairs of wave functions that you will always face in solving the Schrodinger equation. This is the so-called Ronskian the Ronskian of two functions uh, is given by uh, f g prime, so, so uh, g prime equals dg dx. And this is a very good uh, comparison tool to aid your decision making. So in the inline quiz, I'm going to invite you to discover for yourself the key property of the Ronskian operator, why it's so useful. So I guess you can see that uh, in these two cases, uh, you can calculate the Ronskin of these two functions easily. It's that's plus or minus one, depending upon how you do it. And here it's uh, uh, plus or minus uh, two, I guess, depending on on how you do it. Um, but uh, perhaps, perhaps if you think about it, you'll see that if you have um, If you have if you have divergent behavior uh, in this in, in in this case of one function, then uh, you should be able to find another one that converges. Or maybe it's uh, easier to say that if you have oscillatory behavior of one function in this region, uh, and you pick another one, then that's also a solution it's also going to be oscillating in order to keep the Ronsky in a constant. So that's the whole, the real importance is that these alternative pairs of solutions, the Ronsky must be constant. Now the solution to the linear potential, uh, the Schrodinger equation for linear potential, it's very nice properties. Um, so I suppose that these are I suppose the, the area functions must be less familiar to everybody than must be less familiar than the exponential or the trigonometric functions functions to everybody. Uh, but if you, this is your first exposure to them, let me point out that this case of the linear potential uh, gives us two universal solutions that combine both the oscillatory behavior of the trigonometric functions 
and the exponential uh, converging or diverging or converging behavior of the uh, the exponential function. So there's basically um, uh, there's kind of a, u a universal function of each type that um, that 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 covers behavior in the allowed versus forbidden regions. And that is, be if you have if you have a linear potential, then eventually, uh, depending on the choice of v1, uh, eventually eventually the, po the, the potential eventually gets larger than the energy, or eventually gets smaller than the energy, either way around. So in this sense, the linear potential uh, is a very, very nice uh, tool for understanding the behavior of quantum mechanical wave functions. So again, in this case, there's a, uh, a demarcation point. Well, these, of course, these are two particular choices of function, and you can find their definitions in this uh, chapter. And uh, they both oscillate for the, when the argument is less than zero, and uh, then the AI converges for rho greater than zero, and VI diverges. And these two have uh, implementations in physical systems. The one we're going to look at in detail here is the quantum mechanical bouncing ball. Uh, but the second type of area function becomes important in modeling things like the scanning tun tunneling microscope. Now, the bouncing ball problem uh, is, uh, as you'll see, it's important from a uh, technical or theoretical perspective in terms of learning how to solve the Schrodinger equation. But it actually is something that has been uh, recently realized, a uh, remarkable experiment of the um, bouncing of a, a, a neutron confined in a, in a trap and bouncing off a mirror. Uh, and there's actually experiments that measured the quantum mechanical spectrum of the Earth subject to the of the of the neutron subject to the Earth's gravitational field. There have also been some implementations in ultra cold uh, atom systems. So we're actually going to uh, solve the problem with reference to parameters that are germane to this recent experimental realization. So here we're going to describe this amazing neutron experiment. The starting point is something from freshman physics. V is equal to mg, uh, v is equal to mgh, or v is equal to mgx. So the potential energy of the neutron is given by this form, where x is the distance going uh, vertically uh, off the surface of the mirror. G, acceleration of the Earth, due to the Earth's gravity. We just take a nominal value, 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, m, the mass of the neutron, uh, about the same as the mass of the proton. Here's a nominal value. We're just going to use a round number value. And now uh, here is the boundary condition uh, for x equal to 0. So in other words, the wave function has to vanish at the surface of the mirror. That's an idealization. It's largely true. And then it's got a, it's got a, the wave function has to oscillate and reach a point of, ma uh, 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 whatever the energy is, the wave function must die off eventually in order for the neutron to be localized and continue to bounce back and forth in the way that we expect. Now, in order to cast this equation into uh, appropriate dimensional form, uh, I just, we're going to use, we're going to define, you know, I, I've, I've worked this problem out in advance, so we're going to define our dimensionless coordinate rho in terms of this transformation, and I'd like you to look at that in the in video quiz. Right, well, I hope that you found that you could solve the quiz, solve the quiz question using dimensional analysis only, because if you just look at e over mg, I mean, that, that tells you the. Uh, that the dimensional analysis of this expression tells you uh, the answer there. Oh, yeah. So in other words, uh, this parameter alpha has to have the units of energy. I mean, since rho is dimensionless as well, you can see that that's quite clear. Now, 
In the next brief inline quiz, just take it a step further, and this has to do with I, the uh, relationship between row and x. So if you were to draw a row axis, where does it go in this mirror? And what, what for, you know, for example, there's an important, um, important issue regarding what does rho equal 0 mean? What is the physical interpretation of the value of that particular dimension this coordinate? So I hope it was obvious, or I hope it was easy for you to find that the um, value of rho equals 0 describes the classical turning point. That is, when I say the place where the velocity changes sign, it, it represents the maximum distance represents the maximum distance, maximum value of x uh, for uh, which is attained in classical motion. So that means that the function that we're going that we want is ai because uh, well, it attains its maximum a little bit before rho equals zero, but it's the one that dies off as rho gets large, as rho increases beyond into the positive region, which is the classically forbidden region. So we know that we we must of the two solutions that we are going to use, we must use a i. That is the only acceptable solution um, in the region rho greater than zero because the only other possible solution there would involve an admixture of bi, because any, any solution in this region can be written as a linear combination of ai and bi. The one unique solution, up to some overall uh, constant multiple factor, is ai. So if we take that, we now say, now how, knowing that that is the solution, how do we uh, satisfy the boundary condition that um, psi of x equals 0 is equal to 0. Well, um, we're going to write, we're writing the wave function in terms of an airy function, so we have an additional parameter avail uh, available to us, which is the uh, a, a constant offset in the uh, solution, and so that, that means that we basically, we, we take this airy function and we sort of start pulling it up until we until the node lies at the relevant at the surface of the mirror. So uh, I think you can see that what we're going to get is here's the lowest solution would be like that. Then the next lowest solution, oops, the first excited state is, is has a has a node, uh, one node in the wave function, and so on. So basically. The a, the, this curve AI shows you a universal set of profiles of the excited states of the bouncing ball, and they're just obtained by displacing the surface of the mirror to each successive node in the uh, solution AI. Now we'll conclude, actually, really with just a very brief description of what goes on in the quadratic uh, system. We're not going to discuss that in a lot of detail. The most important case of this is uh, concerns the harmonic oscillator, uh, which we've solved elsewhere. But there's sometimes um, things like a harmonic oscillator with uh, dis impurities in it or disruptions, and so it's to, it's nice to have the ability to um, solve the general second order equation. And I'll point out that once again, uh, it turns out that the the divergent character of solutions is the generic one. So, for example, um, uh, in, th in this system, because of the quadratic dependence of x, you know, eventually, uh, v is greater than e. If you go if you go sufficiently far away, sufficient large values of x, positive or negative. Uh, you're in the forbidden region. So, um, the uh, the be, because you have propagation, the sol because you have a wave equation in a uh, forbidden region, you get you always get a divergent solution. 
Uh, but then there are special cases, and these are, you know, these are exactly the uh, eigenvalues of the harmonic oscillator here. You can see this is a harmonic oscillator looking equation. Um, that when um, uh, n is an integer, uh, you get you get bound eigenstates. So this this just shows uh, the the characteristics of uh, this so-called parabolic cylinder function. And uh, we we're not going to make uh, practical use of that in this in this course. But uh, I thought you should see that. Again, the quadratic equations, uh, solutions to the Schrodinger equation for a quadratic potential, are part of this, you know, this uh, systematic family of special functions that's been developed to solve the Schrodinger equations in general. Okay, that concludes this lecture. I hope to see you in the next one.